Okay, so, uh, all right, we'll dial it back. Hi, I'm Anthony Green. Uh, I'm a podcast producer for MIT Technology Review. I've also uh, produced technology podcasts for Vox Media, uh, The Wall Street Journal, and others. I also have a uh, forthcoming podcast that I actually can't tell you too much about, but it is in partnership with PRX. Um, thank you for joining us. Yeah, and I'm Ivan, one of the co-founders and CTO at Cohere. Uh, we're building foundational models to accelerate the next leap of productivity for knowledge work. Um, we do this in a few ways. So, you know, for one, we provide an API and platform to enterprises and developers to build features like summarization, copywriting, and neural search. Um, and we also see enterprises using our models to make themselves more productive. So what, writing an email or uh, building sort of like retrieval augmented generation implementations. Um, we have enterprises sort of using us in both ways uh, in a completely data private manner, actually. So we don't see any of your data. Our philosophy is that we bring the model to your data. I mean, with that said, man, what in your view makes this kind of current AI landscape so exciting? Yeah, so I think if you've been in the field of you know, AI research, AI engineering for the past decade, uh, whenever you do see breakthroughs making onto the news, it's you know, some paper that beat some benchmark that's you know, created uh, you know, a couple of years ago by some academic researchers. Uh, but this time, it's, it's truly different, right? Like, you know, you could go on to these models, try them out, and you actually feel that, you know, hey, like, this is, this is actually useful to my day-to-day -day work. Um, I think that's the big difference this time around is that, you know, these aren't just headlines that you see of AI breakthroughs. They're actually helping you do work. They're actually helping us build better products. You know, it, and what is it? Do you think it's that tangibility? You know, I mean... If we're looking at less than a year ago, there's been this sudden massive leap in awareness and like interest in this field. I mean, what do you think is stoking that? So, you know, there's a few angles to this, right? So, one, the capabilities of these models uh, are much better than what they were before. So, you know, half a decade ago, the models you see were very domain specific. They were good at one thing or one thing, only, you know, entity extraction or classification. Um, whereas the model today, uh, are built off of this architecture called the transformer, yeah. which is really, really good at making use of the compute that we have available. Mm -hmm. So we can pour as much data we want into it to learn all sorts of capabilities. Um, so one, so yeah, one, they're much more capable than before. But uh, another innovation I would actually credit uh, to OpenAI is uh, them launching ChatGPT showed everyone, hey, chat is the interface uh, to interact with these models, right? Giving an instruction, seeing the output, giving a follow-up instruction. Um, that made uh, you know, playing around with these models way more accessible than before, uh, which is just like you know, a playground or something. And even, even a playground uh, for a model was way further than where we were you know, half a decade ago, which is like, you know, go on this GitHub repo, pull this model, um, and you know, maybe run it or something, yeah. <laughs> sure, no doubt. I mean, you know, we're also kind of seeing this nuanced discussion around AI being implemented in the workplace. I mean, what do you have your eyes on there? Yeah, so I think, I, I think companies need to think about um, you know, their AI strategy. And I think it, 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 you have to approach it in a few different angles. Sure. Um, you know, for one, how, how are you going to improve your products to match the market's expectations moving forward? Right. Right? Everyone's tried these generative models nowadays. Uh, they've, you know, they've gotten a taste of that experience, that magic. Yeah. How are you going to build it into your products? Mm -hmm. um, and another angle to look at it from is, you know, how, how is my team going to be more productive using this technology, right? What if my competitors were 30% more productive? What am I going to do about that, right? And that's exactly what we're seeing. Like, we're seeing companies adopting this tech internally, becoming 30 to 50% more productive just with you know, a plain language model, uh, you know, doing really low leverage tasks, if your competitors are 50% more productive than you, that's a risk to your business. Yeah. I mean, in this kind of AI-driven world that we're looking at here, how are you thinking about required skill sets? Uh, what are you seeing as, like, the necessary? So it's, it's interesting, because in some ways, these models make computers way more accessible, yeah. right? The barrier of entry to being able to use a computer to do a productive task, now is just describing your task, 
Um, so in some ways, it's made it easier to use computers, and so you know more people can take advantage of all the hardware that we have. Um, but for organizations to actually accelerate and, and become competitive using this model, uh, you know, I, I would look for folks who are really, really um, diligent about their data mm. and also entrepreneurial about where they could build feedback loops, either in their product features or how they're using the models internally. Because with these feedback loops, you can actually Im further improve the model, and then that becomes your competitive advantage to your competitors, right? If you and your competitors are using the same model, where's the edge? Um, if you can start collecting some of the ways that you're using these models, store that data, and then use a platform like Cohere or you know something else uh, to actually improve these models based on that feedback data, um, then that's your edge. That's your competitive advantage. So looking at the next five years, right, I, I, I want to talk about opportunities and challenges. Maybe let's start with the good news. Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest opportunities for AI? So I think some of the you know immediate opportunities is all the existing text problems that we have, right? Yeah. Search, summarization, autocomplete, those things will get way better with uh, large language models. Um, I think what we're particularly excited about is actually uh, the next phase of these models. So right now, you know, you sort of get text back, um, but what if we give these models tools and teach these models how to use tools? Uh, then we could capture more and more of the low leverage tasks that we have to do. Um, I think I think that's particularly exciting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I don't disagree. All right. Challenges. Um, yeah. So for <laughs> challenges, um, I think what we're seeing in the field right now from just all our customers is how do we evaluate these generative models, right? Between two, you know, models that produce summaries, how can I tell whether one summary is better than the other? Yeah. And how do I scale this evaluation? Because those are very expensive things to compare. You know, you have to read the entire article. You have to read the summary. And it's also completely subjective. Um, so I think evaluating the accuracy of these models uh, is going to be a big challenge. Um, and it's I think that's one of the biggest barriers to adoption, quite honestly. Um, and I think data privacy is another one. So I think you know, right now, we're, we're all sort of taking advantage of uh, all these model providers who are you know, like us or OpenAI or Anthropic, yeah. uh, who are running these models. You know, they we take your data, and we generate some output out of it. Um, you know, if you're writing a really sensitive email, we're seeing that data, uh, and that's not that's not great for you know all the CSOs out there uh, trying to be SOC two compliant or something. Um, so, I, I think data privacy is another big challenge, and it's something we're particularly excited about because that's actually you know our bread and butter. Uh, we believe in bringing in the, the model to your data, uh, as we did for companies like Oracle, right? Hundred um, percent. Uh, I mean, when we're looking at AI's impact on the job market, you know, itself, I mean, uh, are you thinking about displacement and upskilling? You know, how serious should we be taking that? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think about it a lot. Uh, I, think, I think there will be some displacement for sure. Um, I think for lower leverage work, uh, we will probably... I would think about it like this. It's not that you know, we'll take a model to replace like 10 employees. It's that now you need less employees to do the same amount of work. Um, you know, if, if, you know, if your team's 100% more productive, you may need to hire less people, but there's also more, more opportunities uh, for folks to build new products or start new projects, sure. right? You know, if the barrier of entry to writing a great website or building you know, some server just becomes you know, how how great are you at prompting the model to generate that code, yeah. then we'll have many, many more sort of products and servers and websites and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I, you know, I'm obviously biased and I'm quite optimistic that that's going to be the case. Um, so I, I think there'll be new opportunities and new jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Fair, fair. So, all right. Robots aren't coming for our jobs yet. Uh, but, I mean, in terms of the actual work that we do, how do you see that being augmented by these tools? So, I, I think... Honestly, the, the, the main message is just that we'll, we'll be way better at using computers with these models. I think right now, you sort of have to learn this weird language, you know, either through programming to give the computer some instruction, or you have to learn some graphical interface to know where to click, that, that, that. Um, I think in the future, you know, using a computer is going to be like having an assistant, right? You're just giving it instructions 
and it performs a series of actions to do that for you. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not particularly concerned. I, I don't know. <laughs> all right, <laughs> it's like all quite right. exciting, honestly. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. No, I don't disagree. I mean, but, but you know, let's do a quick break check, right? So, I mean, how mature is this technology really, you know, in your view? I, I still think there's ways to go in scaling up these models. Yeah. Um, right now, if you've, you know, I, I'm sure most of you play with it. It's, it's really good, but it's not 100%. Um, and e even just for these, like, you know, write me an email to do blah, 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 like generating text, right? It's not 100% it's not accurate even for that kind of task. Uh, but to get to the world where we can actually have these models be perfect at a series of actions on a computer, we're going to need bigger models. We're going to need, a, you know, way more data, way more compute. Um, and that, that's something, you know, companies like Cohere is really focused on. Um, but yeah, I think it's not quite there yet today, but uh, you know, we'll get there. I'd like to pull it back a little bit and get a bit more personal. Let's talk about you. Okay. How did you come to be in this position? I mean, what inspired you to get, get into this work? Uh, quite honestly, I was, um, I was already dropped out of school. And so I was, I was two years into school. I dropped out to work at my friend's startup. Um, and I was looking to learn something new, and it seems like this deep learning thing was kind of interesting. And that's when I met my co-founder, Aiden Gomez. Uh, he invented the Transformers, which is like the T in GPT. Um, and so him and I started collaborating together, and one day he had this idea of you know, taking his project at Google and scaling it up and making it available for developers. Uh, but qu quite honestly, at the time, and this, this was in 2019, we saw all the pieces you know, lying there for us to build a world where we can actually talk to computers. You know, language models are starting to get adopted within Google to do text processing. Um, and, you know, we thought, okay, if, if computers can start understanding language, they can start generating language. Hey, like, we can just scale this up and put this together and, you know, have some APIs for de developers to start shipping features, shipping software uh, towards this vision of a world where, you know, computers are literally interoperating with us, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. That's fascinating. I mean, when it comes to what you see as coming next, right, uh, for these technologies. Uh, what's on your radar? What are you envisioning? Yeah, so I definitely, you know, uh, action models, action taking models. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll have to get a lot better at uh, sort of like the enterprise adoption. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a series of features needed for any new tech for the enterprise to be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those sort of engineering and product problems that we'll need to solve. Um, I think accuracy for these models will need to be improved as well. Um, I think multimodal multimodality is also a very interesting area. You know, definitely, you know, you and I learn not just by reading raw text, right? We we receive signal and intelligence from multiple um, forms of information. So, yeah, yeah multimodality, action, yeah. yeah. Mm. No, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I mean, when we think about the question of How to optimize for accuracy. I mean, obviously, if you had the perfect answer to that, you know, uh, it would be a different question. But I mean, where do we begin to kind of address and start to tackle that issue? So this is why I've mentioned the feedback loops, right? It's yeah. really important to have yeah. someone at your company who is uh, entrepreneurial, innovative enough to find these feedback loops within your products, within your you know, internal processes. Uh, because that is the way the model learns to become perfect at whatever you want it to do. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit controversial, but uh, in some ways, all the software that we're using and we're writing is, is quite temporary, right? Like we're, you know, programmers are sort of guessing what, what form factor best solves your problem. And we're building, you know, GUIs and, and tools to, to try to guess how you best want to solve that problem. Uh, these language models have the potential to actually just learn exactly what you're doing on the computer to solve that precise problem. Um, so I think in the future, it'll look a lot like, you know, you uh, spin up like an instance of an LLM, you actually just co-pilot with it to do your precise type of work, and it'll learn to do that within two to three weeks. Um, so I think, yeah, I think having a great feedback loop and having someone to own that piece uh, of a feedback strategy for your company will be like, like essential. Yeah. I think I know your answer to the next question, but I'm obviously going to ask it anyways. 
what's something about this field that might seem on the outset something that's pretty easy to do, but is actually quite difficult? Um, yeah, I think uh, training these models is quite difficult. Uh, I know there's all these like open source projects uh, popping up of people replicating or claiming that they're you know as good as ChatGPT or something. Um, yeah, it's yeah. I I would say to you all just just try these models, um, and you'll see it's it's not quite the same, and and there's a lot more work th uh, that goes into training large language models that's different from something like you know open source software, right? Getting open source software right you know requires one person who's really energized and is like really dedicated to the cause. Uh, with large language models, it's a whole operation, right? You have to get the data right. You have to solve, you know, large distributed compute problems. You have, to, you have to secure the compute. You actually have to have access to the compute to actually train these models. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it might seem like every other day there's a new foundational model that is really, really good, uh, but it's, it's actually like really difficult to, to train these models. You know, uh, honestly, I'm just really curious about this because, you know, when you talk to technologists, uh, a lot of them will say they had a moment where I use this, what we might consider now crappy, clunky, et cetera, piece of tech, and it opened my eyes, right? For me, it was like the cheesy spy toys, like for kids, you know, like I used to set up motion detectors in my house and stuff and track them on the little board. And I don't know, it, it, it all like culminated in me being obsessed with technology. Was there, is there a device for you where you got it into your hands and you were like, huh, interesting. This, this, is, this is changing things for me. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I was young, I had the privilege of having a personal computer, right? Oh, okay. I think like using Windows yeah. uh, for the first time and, and you know, hearing the modem beep, beep, beep. And uh, you know, actually, just browsing the internet, I was like, "Wow, like this, this stuff is really cool." Okay. Maybe that you know ages me a little bit, but um, yeah, I, I think like you know, computers. I, I've been obsessed with computers my whole life. Yeah. Um, I've been a big gamer as well, and so uh, I, yeah, like I, I, I love computers. <laughs> yeah. Anything surprised you throughout all this research? Um, yeah, I guess the most surprising thing is how intuitive it is to train these models, uh, much like um, how we educate children, right? We send them to JK to 12, which is like sort of like a general curriculum of all sorts of domains. Um, that's sort of like pre-training uh, the foundational models with you know, diverse sources uh, of data. And then you know, you know, once a kid is, has a sufficient world knowledge, we send them to school and then they go to work to be aligned with a you know, specific set of actions. And I feel like that's very similar to how we train language models, which makes me really excited because it's like, wow, like this is actually very similar to how we raise children or like oh, raise 100%. humans, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Robots are the new kids, you heard it here first. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, sir. Yeah, cool.